Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? So liking the new setup, man. Yeah, you think so? Try, You've been complaining get... about it for five minutes. so I... <laughs> I have. It's it's different. I think we'll get used to it. I think I'll get used to it because it's very weird for me. Yeah, I'm not sure I can maintain this position for an entire podcast. I might have to get a, a higher table. Well, that's me because I'm used to being able to kind of... I feel like I can move around more in a normal podcast. If I need to dance, I can dance around. I can't dance around right now. You can't dance at all. <laughs> well, <laughs> doesn't mean I can't try. <laughs> no. Well, um, it, when you're not saying anything, uh, which is a fair amount of time in the podcast it usually, is, it is. Uh, you can sit back all you want. <laughs> well, fair enough. You just got to move back into gotta, the mic before gotta, you say anything. I just got to rush up here when I have something to say. <laughs> the upside is whenever you need to cough. Yeah. You I really just need to turn your head away. You yeah, because it won't you pick you up. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it'll probably still pick you up a little bit, but yeah. um, it's certainly, like, if you turn like you'd been doing, yeah. um, then good. it won't yeah. pick you up at all. Nice. Uh, and the other side is that um, that we're independent, so if you say something stupid, I can just cut it out without cutting out my own stuff. <laughs> and the same for you. Uh, <laughs> no, but I I'm, I have editor control. Oh, so. yes. <laughs> Final word that, is mine. This this is very true. When you want to learn how to do all this stuff, you, I'm happy to teach you. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> so. uh, the well, okay. This does make it more difficult to drink while we're casting. Yeah, I noticed that when we were kind of testing things out a minute ago. Like, like it is. Like, I mean, you can do it, but like, you gotta gotta do it quick. <laughs> yeah. You gotta mean it. <laughs> right. You gotta go <laughs> in with a purpose. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. we'll we'll work it out. I'm sure. I, we'll I'm find quite, a way to drink. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite talented <laughs> at finding a way to drink. So um, hopefully that can continue. There you go. Look at that. Got it in there. I made sure to jingle the ice in front of the microphone so that people know yeah, that you're ruining I am, my I am not going to be able to help that now. Like yeah. <laughs> with this mic right here, I guess if I like move away from the mic to drink. <laughs> That's all you got to do. Oh. Uh, well, um, we, we did a podcast a day early apparently last week. Yeah, we kind of missed out on some big news. Yeah. So uh, we, we spent the last podcast, the, or the last half of it anyway, um, talking about Iran and the escalations there. And then there was a real escalation Friday in the early hours, Friday morning. Yeah, there definitely was. That's, I tell you, man, it's it's getting rough over there. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think it's calming down, actually, at this particular moment. So we, we missed the most exciting part, but... Um, in the wee hours of Friday morning, um, we uh, launched a drone, I, I just can't think of another word, but assassination uh, attack on um, General Qasem Soleimani. Qasem Soleimani. Yeah, I cannot say that name. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a rough one. Yeah. Um, not as not as bad as some of them. There's, yeah, I have trouble with a lot of them. So yeah, um, there were also a couple of guys from the uh, um, the PMUs, which is the Iraqi militia units that we were talking about before, that are um, akin to National Guard. Yeah, um, there were a couple of those guys in those in the convoy as well in the car. Um, it was just outside of Baghdad Airport, and we um, we dropped a, a bomb and or actually I think it was a Hellfire missile or whatever but from a drone right from a drone yeah blew up the car uh and um and we took out probably the second or third most powerful man in iran yeah and that's i tell you man like that one's where i kind of have a problem because like like this is an actual iranian official like i mean i guess he's a general but he's Mm -hmm. still he's an arm of the iranian government and for i just there's it seems like there's a line there. I mean, Obama drone bombed tons of people, but for the most part, they were all terrorists. They weren't, I say terrorists, but they weren't like tied to a government. Yeah. I mean, that's the big difference between killing an Osama bin Laden or uh, uh, just recently. And I don't even know that we talked about this on the podcast for some, somehow we skipped over it um, mm. when we killed uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Yeah. Uh, again, these are people that were essentially stateless. Yeah, um, and and to me, there is there is a distinction there between between somebody who is like you say stateless and mm-hmm. somebody that's like attached to a government. Yeah, and it's a funny thing to hear from somebody who is on the whole 
opposed to states in general. I am. Well, <laughs> for the most part. I, yeah. mean, I don't know. It just it feels like there's there's definitely a distinction there though. No, I agree. Um I, I agree. And I think that a you know, the whole hundreds of uh Americans killed by Soleimani is just a it's just a lie, really. Right. I mean part of it is that the way things have gone over there, um any any American killing that can be connected in some way to a Shiite is then connected to Iran. Yeah. Regardless. It, that, yeah, it doesn't even matter how just loosely yeah. connected. Well, and that's, mm-hmm. that was the reason. That was part of the reason for for assassinating him, right? Was because they were attacking our embassy, or that's that's what you. Yeah. So well, that's we what, triggered that. I mean, yeah. but that that attack was already planned. So yeah. I mean, the, that was the words that we were responding to the. To the uh, assault on the embassy, the assault. I'll put that in air quotes. Yeah. Um, because of, from my understanding of that is, it wasn't ho- a whole lot of an assaulting going on. Like they didn't have any chance to get to anybody. No, the the embassy was never in any real danger. That is a compound there in Baghdad. Yeah. This oh, it has to be. <laughs> um, and uh, so they were at the visitors gate, uh, as I understand it. And they were, I mean, essentially what they did was they painted a graffiti on the walls and um, they managed to set fire to a um, a visitor's reception area. Yeah. Uh, it's just not that big a deal. Yeah, that's not very far into the compound, I would imagine. No, I, I think the important part is that the Iraqi security forces allowed the mob, such as it was, um, to get that far. Yeah. Uh, it was a statement that was being made. Yeah. And um, once they felt that they'd made the statement, they kind of dispersed. There wasn't well, a lot to it. Yeah, my understanding is, as far as like Iraq is concerned in general, they're they're pretty well like they've passed a resolution to like ask us to leave. Not that it's binding or anything, mm-hmm. but they they have done that. And when you think about, it, can you really blame them? Like so, so let's just look from their perspective how this has all played out here. So we. Uh, we killed the the general by bombing Iraq. <laughs> then, then how does how does Iran respond? They come back and bomb Iraq again. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, poor Iraq and all of this. <laughs> right? They're sitting here like, go bomb somebody else. Like, why yeah. bomb our country? Like, come on, guys. Like, yeah. we're just kind of the middleman here for bombs. <laughs> well, and we've essentially been bombing Iraq since 1991. Right? <laughs> I mean, let's just bomb Iraq. I mean, yeah. come on. Well, poor that guy. was the danger all along is that it, it, there's little chance that we'll end up with a war in Iran. Yeah. Um, what yeah. would happen? We'll probably fight it in Iraq. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's exactly it. Uh, Iraq will be a, a proxy war between Iran and the U.S. Yeah. Um, just like uh, Yemen has become a proxy war uh, between Iran and the U.S. And Syria was a proxy war between Iran and the U.S. Yeah. Um, we're, and part of it is that there's a real recognition by the military in the U.S. that a- an invasion of Iran would be costly. Yeah, like, I mean that's gonna yeah, and you when you say costly, you mean like bodies piling up. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, unless of course we drop a bomb. Uh, but in, if that were to happen, then I think that we can be fairly sure that that no country will ever trust us again. Yeah, because there will be uh, at that point three um, atomic bombs dropped in war. And they will have all been dropped by the U.S. And not only that, like in in modern times, like in mm-hmm. in re- you'll be able to point to that as, hey, like y'all did that, you know? Yeah. Like recently, well, <laughs> like when a- you knew what the repercussions were for mm-hmm. dropping one. I mean, you make an argument. Well, we were just figuring all that stuff out back then. You can't make that argument now. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is that uh, there's a big difference between the the A bombs that we dropped in Japan and the H bombs that we would be dropping now. Oh yeah, we'd turn it to glass out there, man. Yeah. Um. There's a there's orders of magnitude difference in the power of those bombs. Yeah. So, um. Well, yeah. let's hope it, it doesn't come it to that. It scares me to even think that that would be an option. And I hear people joke about that, like being an option. We just need to. They want a bomb. We need to give them one. And I've heard that line more times than I can count the past week, and it just, it, it it just goes to show that people don't understand like how serious of a thing that is. Yeah, well, um, that's a quick way to draw other people in too, um, because that 
that represents a threat to many other nations. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that we would be willing to to drop an H bomb on a country. Yeah. Um, the so there's little. I, I'm not concerned at this point uh, about this leading to World War Three because Russia has shown little interest in getting involved. Yeah. But that might change if we were dropping oh, a, an H bomb in, in Iran. Um, but you know, as long as Russia it isn't interested in getting involved, this isn't going to extend outside of the Middle East, and it's probably not even going to extend outside of Iraq. Uh, well, other than how it already has, like I said, with Yemen, Syria, etc. Once again, um, poor Iraq. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, they're just the the whipping boy here for everybody, yeah. it seems. Um, but you know, the just the fact that you would assassinate a um, Iranian general on Iraqi soil. Um, and not to mention, like I said, there were at, at least two uh, popular mobilization units, is what they're called, the the um, like National secure, Guard like type. Security detail type thing. Well, no. Um, it's the militia units that are functioning as Iraqi security, like mm. state security. Gotcha. Uh, so, like I said, this is the National Guard type units. Yeah. Um, there were two uh, representatives of the PMUs, at least in those car in that car as well, and so you've not only um, blown up a uh, representative of another nation in Iraq, but you've also blown up two Iraqi government representatives in Iraq, yeah. and this is supposedly the government that we're trying to protect, and it's the government that we installed, yeah. and they're leaders of militia units that we've been fighting alongside against ISIS. And uh, and other Sunni jihadist groups for a long time. Yeah, I mean the history so, of this thing is so screwy. Anyway, um, you know, there's the if you go back to the Seymour Hirsch article about the redirection. Uh, but when we went into Iraq in 2003, um, we went in there to fight uh, Al Qaeda, ostensibly and but primarily um, to uh, bring down the Ba'athist regime. Uh, headed by Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Um, these are all Sunni groups, and uh, and the Sunnis are a minority in Iraq, and they were at that time too. So it was uh, at the time that we went in there, um, the Shia are about sixty percent uh, of the population of Iraq, but the government was controlled by the forty percent population of Sunnis. Um, and what we did, and of course Iran is is primarily Shia as well. Yeah. And so what we did is we went in there and we took out the Sunni minority government. Um, in this majority Shia country. And then we seem to have been surprised when the Shia took over and that increased the influence of Iran in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, and then there was this realization like, oh, well, we just fought a war for Iran in Iraq, our mortal enemy, Iran. <laughs> uh, now, why that idea is still there, I, I can't really explain. But um, I, I guess because the world began in 1979 when they overthrew the Shah <laughs> and... Uh, and took the American embassy hostage. Yeah. Of course, that's not really the case, but... Yeah, there's a lot that happened I mean, before they, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the... Uh, um, what, what's the phrase? Uh, they're truncating the antecedents. They're forgetting about everything that came before. Yeah. Like, you know, how we installed the Shah who ruled with an iron fist for a quarter century yeah. um, beforehand. It was one of the most oppressive rulers in, in the Middle East. Anyway. Um, so we, we overthrow the Sunni government. Uh, the Shia take over. Um, because we were fighting with them. Yeah. I, I mean, we were aligned with them. And then that gave the uh, Iranians greater influence in Iraq. And we realized this, and that's when the redirection occurred. Now, the problem was that we couldn't fight the war in Iraq again, but on the other side this time. <laughs> yeah, that's not really going to work. <laughs> um, because then it would be clear to all, even us silly Americans that don't pay attention to this stuff that, like, we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah, right. Um and so instead, uh, we focused on uh, taking out the close ally of, of Iran. Well, the uh, I don't know how close it was, really, but the Iranian ally in Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Yeah. Uh, that's when the war in Syria started. So um, the same Sunni jihadists that we had been pushing out of Iraq, uh, out the west side of Iraq into Syria, we then started arming and funding in Syria against their government. But that didn't really work out either, either because they would take our... Uh, our money and guns and turn around, come back across the border in Iraq and keep fighting the Americans. <laughs> oh, insanity, man. And yeah. It, yeah, it just makes you wonder why we even bother being over there. But 
which is goes to something else I wanted to kind of talk about tonight. Yeah. So um, I don't know how much you heard, but on the way here tonight, um, they passed a. Um, is everything looking good over there? My bad. Yeah, it's good. Okay. I'll, um, I'll signal you if something's wrong. All right. So the House passed a um, resolution, and I believe this resolution is non-binding, but it may. there was two versions of it floating around. They may have passed a, a binding version. At any rate, um, restricting Trump as the president as far as being able to do, use military actions, kind of like what he did here with this general. Mm-hmm. Um and the house passed that on literally on my way in. I, I heard it on the radio. Okay, I hadn't heard about that. Um, which I'd heard all day that they w- that it was that both houses had a version of it, and that they were working on it. Um, mm-hmm. Which, of course, this has no chance of of getting signed by the president, um, and and passing a veto proof through Congress. So it's all just kind of um, just a show. It's really just a show, but it, it does beg a question as far as. You know, so if they did pass this and was able to get it veto proof, would that be the best thing in the scenario we're in now to tie Trump down as far as and I say Trump, but this is any president as far as what they can do militarily in these countries. I mean, I kind of am curious to what you would say to that. Um, I would say that it would make no difference whatsoever because the what they're passing a resolution to do is already in the Constitution is agreed. 100% 100% agree. And that's if the reason. If you can reason. ignore the Constitution, so, which is the law of the land, you can't change the Constitution with a resolution or with legislation. Yeah. Well, um, what they're trying to do so. is so right now they're working off the 2002 resol- war, war on terror resolution or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's the uh, this, authorization for use of military yeah, force. This yeah. would be a new one that would restrict him. And so he wouldn't be able to operate off the original one that they've been using. He'd have to operate off whatever constraints was in this new version. And I mm-hmm. don't know specifically what all's in there, but kind of kind of the angle I was taking when I was hearing it and listening today was, I, it just made me think, okay, so we're, we're extended in these countries. Like we've got military all over all of these countries. And I don't agree with that. I think we should be doing everything we can to bring them home. Mm -hmm. But given the fact that we've got so much presence over there, taking away the president's ability to to manage the situation, is that the best option? Whether it's whether it's Trump or Obama, because that's that's kind of the question you have to ask is. You know, because I didn't agree with any of this when when Obama was doing the drone strikes. I was absolutely against that. Yeah, well, I think that they would just have to enforce the Constitution to begin with, and they don't do that. And the AUMF doesn't actually give him any authority to launch uh, attacks against Iran either. Yeah. But you get those uh, um, those White House attorneys in there, and they could figure out some way around it. Find I a mean, loophole. The, yeah, the AUMF says that uh, he, well, the 2002 one says that he can go into Iraq. Um, but the 2001 one, the, the 2002 one was an addendum to it, essentially. Yeah. Um, the 2001 one says that he's free to pursue the terrorists uh, involved in the 9-11 attacks and associated groups. So do well, you this think- is literally like Iran's, the, the Shia groups are literally on the other side of a war from the groups that launched the, the terror the attacks. The terror attacks, yeah. So. so, yeah, but then you get into that term terrorism. I mean, you know, what what is defined as terrorism you yeah. know, versus what's defined as an act of war? Mm-hmm. Well, well, we talked a few weeks ago about what is the advantage of uh, of identifying the drug cartels as terrorists. Yeah. And this oh, yeah. is essentially, this, this is, is this, one of those things. This is things. the same yeah. thing, the mm-hmm. same type deal. It absolutely is. Yeah. Um, um, and speaking of declaring someone's terrorists, of course, like, I guess we have the ability to uh, define um, Qasem Soleimani. Soleimani. I'm really having trouble with that name. Nah, I, dude, I'd just uh, say the general because I can't. <laughs> I, I know I can't do it. Yeah. Uh, general Qasem Soleimani. Um, we can call him a terrorist because we named the entire IRGC, the uh, Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, as terrorists um, two years ago, maybe now. Really? Some, something like that. I can't remember. It was a while back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we named the entire IRGC. I thought we talked about that. Uh, well, that might have been before the podcast. Um, 
anyway, uh, that that was a problem to begin with because this is a, a state military force. And what kind of precedent does it set to, to identify a state military force as terrorists? Yeah. Well, what then happens to our military well, forces? Well, that was, I was And that's what say. Iran did. What's, what's the flip side of that? Yeah, basically. I mean, but here's the deal. They, they still didn't take it to the level they could have. Um, and that's kind of the thing. I mean, they basically told them they were going to bomb these sites, so all the mm -hmm. personnel and stuff got evacuated. What if they hadn't have done that? Yeah. Well, I mean, in the immediate aftermath of the Soleimani killing, um, the Iraqi parliament passed the resolution uh, to expel the U.S. troops from Iraq. Yeah. Um, and the Iranian uh, government declared um, U.S. troops a terror organization. Yeah. Um, so... And then they followed up with these attacks. And I think this was, you know, this is kind of a calculated uh, de-escalation um, for them. They announced yeah. to the U.S. that they were, I, I mean, they notified Iraq. They notified the, uh, is it the Swiss embassy, um, which is the uh, um, representative of the U.S. in Iran, that they were going to launch these attacks and win. No, um, nobody was killed. And that was all calculated, and it gave everybody the chance. I, so what I think of is I think of like samurai, right? Yeah. Um, they they need a way to withdraw from the fight with honor, and this is this, this is what a, it this, was. This was a way to do that. Yeah. yeah. Which is fortunate because I mean, could have went the other way. They could have mm -hmm. been like, okay, you know. Well, and I, I still have I some questions about where this goes from here because yeah. um, the U.S. has made it clear that they don't really care what the Iraqis say about them having to leave their country. Uh, so what happens when uh, when the prime minister of Iraq sends the letter or whatever it, they're looking for or waiting for yeah. um, that says, OK, all the uh, the U.S. troops, they need to leave our country. You're not invited anymore. Yeah. Um, and the U.S. says no. Yeah. Hey, how does that play out? <laughs> yeah. Um, and how does the rest of the world respond to that? And the un the kind of unfortunate thing here is that the U.S. has such a powerful military that nobody can really do anything about it. Yeah. I mean, we kind of get to make our own rules, and we have been for a long time. Yeah, which is, is dangerous, though, because mm -hmm. we do. We have, without question, we've got the most powerful military, but it's also very extended right now. I mean, we've got, got troops everywhere and got stuff going on everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, how long can we sustain this, you know? Um, well, uh, according to modern monetary theory, uh, forever. Forever, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, but that's we all know that's going to collapse yeah. at some point. Um, Absolutely. And and what happens then? You know. Well, and to me, the okay, the real question is how do you get um, normal Americans involved, contacting their representatives and senators and saying, hey, you got to put an end to this, you got to put an end to this, and and being loud enough to actually get it done, yeah. to make those people believe that if they don't put an end to this, they're not going to get reelected because that's all they really care about. Yeah. Um, and the like, so how do you get Americans to care about this thing that's going on, on the other side of the world? I mean, you can talk about deaths. You know, you, there's, what, 150,000 Afghani um Afghanis are dead because of the war over there. Yeah, but Americans people, don't even care about the twenty five hundred U.S. I was people that say, are yeah, dead I mean, because it, of that. Exactly, you took my point. That's exactly what I was going to say. They barely care about our own people, much less. Yeah, I mean, um, so how do you get them to care? And I, I think that it's the the same answer that it always is for everything, um, which is that you you talk about their wallet. Yeah, um, you say, look. Uh, how much do you pay in taxes every year? Whatever that number happens to be. Let's say that that number, the, your federal taxes uh, come up to, um, just make it easy, and say $10,000. Okay. You pay $10,000 to the federal government. Now, that's a small tax burden, by the way, but um, <laughs> you, we'll say you pay $10,000 to your federal government. We'll just say, hey, look, 2500 of that was used to blow up things on the other side of the world. Yeah. Like, Wouldn't it be nice to have that $2,500 back? Yeah. Exactly. Um, or on the left, you can just say, hey, instead of spending that twenty five hundred dollars blowing things up on halfway around the world, wouldn't it have been better if we put that money into health care or education or whatever the. I've heard that argument quite a bit from the left that, you know, quit blowing up my my Medicaid money or yeah. whatever. You well, know? and that's the <laughs> argument that Tulsi's making. I think yeah. I think Tulsi's uh, economics are terrible. 
Yeah. But at least her method of funding them right now is to stop spending the money on the wars and spend that same money instead on things back, yeah. back here. And while home. I still have trouble supporting that, oh, I, mean, yeah. I can support that more than I can what we're currently doing. Hey, it's moving in the right direction, at least. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'll um, take that. And, and, of course, for the, the conservatives, like, wouldn't you rather have that money in your pocket that you could invest how you see fit? Yeah. Investing that money into the con- economy, mm-hmm. that old Keynesian. <laughs> yeah, or it, even if it's just like you know, put a down payment on a car or whatever. That's still better than it being blown up halfway around the world. What benefit are you seeing from that? Oh yeah, there's no benefit to for us for that at all. Yeah. You know? um, well, they say that we're making the world a safer place. Yeah. Well, we all we all know though. I say we all, but. Um, it's, it's just not the case. It, it, every time we drop one of those bombs, we make the world a more dangerous place. Yeah, and the, the prime example is that at the time of 9-11, Al-Qaeda was 400 guys, give or take, um, scattered across the, the Middle East and North Africa. And now Al-Qaeda and affiliated groups is like 40,000 guys. Yeah. Um, so we certainly haven't made the world safer in, in that respect. No. Um, and it makes I'll, you wonder how we can use that same type thing for the liberty movement. <laughs> like if they've yeah. grown like that, what can we do with the we liberty movement? Go around and start killing important libertarians, <laughs> get people fired up. No, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't either. think that's a good idea either. I'm just saying, man, there's gotta be something there. We got gotta be something we can build off of here, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well it required violence from yeah. somebody else. We well, can't have violence we, though. So that won't a, work. <laughs> we can have liberty people go out into like you know, liberal areas in MAGA hats or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you think that's the plan? <laughs> hey, maybe, man. <laughs> or, uh, and go into conservative areas with, uh, you know, Obama with hats. Bernie hats. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Bernie feel, the, with, feel the burn hats. Yeah, all right. <laughs> oh, you be feeling the burn. <laughs> <laughs> and they light you on fire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and the real danger of this is, um, you know, again, the, the problems that it creates at home. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, this seems like a fine time to transition. I, you know, what's going on in Iran is being reported everywhere. I mean, our perspective isn't exactly being reported everywhere, no, but which is the reason I wanted to make sure we talked about this tonight because I mean, it is reported everywhere, all day, every day, right now. And mm-hmm. you're not there's a lot, so much of this you're just not getting the the story on. And there's so much war propaganda right now. It really is kind of incredible. Um, well, and I did want to mention just like something to think about, like, what is it about this guy? Yeah. Um, this guy, uh, Hadim or whatever his name was, the contractor that was killed. Yeah. Um, like how is it that his death is so important as to create this kind of escalation? This is not the first U S contractor to die over there. Why, yeah. why did this one trigger this kind of escalation? Well, didn't Russia have something like a hundred contractors die a couple of years ago? Oh, a year uh, or so ago. Yeah. At the hands of the U S yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I, cause I, I remember when it happened and it was brought up the other day on something I was watching or listening to. I was like, man, yeah, I had forgotten about that because Russia showed major restraint in in that situation, more so than we've shown. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, well, I mean, all this talk about Putin being a crazy man, he's shown far more restraint than our government has. Um, And a a real desire to prevent escalation of any kind. Yeah. Um, Which at least with the U.S. If we're going to have that many people over there, I mean, that's that's more the attitude we should have anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, just I mean, I don't I don't agree with having that many people over there. So it's yeah. kind of a hard argument for me to even make. But it just seems like we need to to be more thoughtful in our actions over there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was looking into this contractor. Right. And this is why I bring it up. Okay. And it may it probably is meaningless in the end. Um, but by all accounts. Um, uh, uh, tragedy it may be, but um, he was just a he's just a random interpreter. Really? Yeah, I mean he's just he's just some guy who was over there. He was um, no CIA I think he was originally. Or nothing. I don't, I don't think so. I mean I don't know. That's the question, right? Like what yeah. what makes this guy so important? Yeah. Um, and I I <laughs> I emailed Scott Horton about it today because I was like I you know am, am I just being conspiratorial that there's something else about this guy i mean or, or was it they were they just looking for any excuse and his response was they were just looking for any excuse like yeah. um and so that probably is the case but i don't 
that's a question worth asking, I think, still. Yeah. Um, now, and to transition to the next one part, um, the guy Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago about his time in the Russian gulags, um, he said uh, a, state of war, a state of war serves only as an excuse for domestic tyranny. Yeah. And that's the part that I worry about um, is that, like, I mean, we became a national security state long ago. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, you can take 9-11 and move forward. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we became a national security state before that. Before that. But it, uh, the, it, I think the Cold War made us a national security state. Yeah. Um, you may not be long, wrong, but it definitely took an uptick after 9-11. Oh, yeah. They absolutely. became, I, and I, I would I would argue they just became more open about it after mm -hmm. 9-11. I mean, not that a lot of these things weren't going on or kind of behind the scenes prior to that. But, I mean, now it's like they campaign on it. Yeah. You know? I mean, they had the Patriot Act ready in no time. That was written already. Yeah. Yeah, it, they just needed a reason. Yeah. Um, and uh, I love these names. Um, the Patriot Act, the Freedom Act. Like, they, <laughs> they tend to do the opposite. Whatever it says it is, it's the opposite. It's the it's opposite like, of that, yeah. It's like putting a Democratic Republic in your in the name of your country. Mm -hmm. If it if it says Democratic Republic of whatever, it yeah. is probably neither Democratic nor, <laughs> nor a Republic. Nor Republic, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, these, these kinds of... Um, Acts of Congress are are the same. Yeah. Uh, they're you know the, let's give it a nice name that makes it sound like it's exactly what you want, and then and what we're actually doing is we're taking away uh, we're taking away your rights and freedoms. Yeah. Um, we're taking away your independence. Uh, you know we're taking away your liberty. Yeah. And um, this is what keeps happening. And, and the this war state is you know we uh, criticize the law enforcement sometimes on this podcast. Um, but I think that a big part of that is the war state. I, Agreed. I don't know if somebody else said this or if this is just something that I've been thinking for a really long time and it's actually mine. Um, but I, so I don't know if I'm stealing somebody else's <laughs> line. I apologize. I, just, I don't even remember reading it. Um, but I, I think that it's hard to maintain uh, a nation's morality when you're constantly at war. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because all your all your soldiers coming back, they're all like victims of this whole situation, mm -hmm. you know. So you've got all these people coming back. Plus, you're looking at it on the TV day mm -hmm. in and day out and out, you know. I yeah, mean, you're normalizing it. it. Yeah, exactly. Normalizing um, the violence. Yeah, and we've talked about that on this podcast as far as the mass shootings go. That mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's as good of of thing to point to as any. Yeah, you know, as far as like a reasoning for it. You know, I mean, it's definitely started in the past few years, you know, past couple of decades. Yeah, I, I, it's a fairly new phenomenon, I think. So. Um, and part of that is, again, because of the national security state, though, too, that you, <laughs> there are safe places to perform a shooting because, you know, nobody will have guns. Yeah. And that wasn't always true in this country. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, we're we're thirty minutes in or so, and I was hoping to keep this kind of short because uh, I'm sore. This and is uncomfortable situ talking situation. We're gonna have to get used to this. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, we'll make some we'll make some changes. We'll figure it out. Um, I don't think that I can make these stands be Higher? any taller. Yeah, because that's yeah. another. I can hey. make my chair lower. You can't. <laughs> no, I was gonna say you got a lot of books sitting around here. Maybe I'll just use a book. Yeah, you can kneel. Yeah. Oh yeah, all right. I'm yeah. gonna kneel down for an hour. I'll give you a pillow. <laughs> oh yeah, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, Mike always thinking about me. <laughs> well, uh, we had the the shooting in um, Texas in the church. Yes. And you know, talking about you, you used to never know who might have a gun. Um, yeah, well, you still don't in Texas. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, and while there's been some weird spins on this story, yeah. um, I, I think that it is a clear example that um, the idea that uh, a good guy with a gun will stop a bad guy with a gun is a myth is yeah. a myth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. I, I think that this is a good example of that. Um, and, you know, the guy who, who actually uh, put an end to the show, well, you want to give background on people that don't know what happened? Um, sure. So, um, I mean, this is the story as far as I know it is um, this guy came into the church with a shotgun and basically was, was put down almost immediately. I mean, I watched a video from it where the guy comes in and like, so you see the one guy that ends up shooting him 
in the head, <laughs> like first shot. Yeah, from like thirty yards from, with a from pistol. a good distance. Yeah. yeah. Um, put him down, but then you look around the room. He wasn't the only one that pulled the gun. Like, mm. so he was the one that made the shot. But like three other people you see in the video, six I maybe think. it may have been more than that. Like, yeah. it was kind of well, where's Waldo of guns? <laughs> <Yeah>. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, the guy came in. He got off two quick shots with his shotgun, and he he killed two people in the church. And yeah. um, but the reaction was swift. Yeah. Uh, and the guy who did put him down, he's a firearms instructor, owns his own range. Um, he contracted with the sheriff's department or something before that. Yeah. And so this is being used. Oh, and they also keep referring to um, him as a member of the church's security team. Oh, like yeah. they're some kind of special organization or whatever. That's not true. That ain't how he, that, yeah. He's a parishioner. Now, it might have been a bunch of volunteers. I mean, I know some places around here where they have... Um, people that have some firearms training that volunteer to carry in church to be security in case something happens yeah. like this. Well, and I know a lot of churches, um, like they encourage their law enforcement people to sh- come to church in their uniform, you know? Yeah. Um, so. Well, and their law enforcement people are almost certainly carrying their guns because you're yeah. supposed to. Well, yeah. Yeah. Whether they're in uniform or not. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's changed over the years. Certainly when my dad was active in law enforcement, like he was supposed to carry his gun everywhere. Yeah, he didn't have a choice. Yeah, yeah, he had to fight every time he entered an airport. (laughs) Right, (laughs) over whether he could have this or not. Yeah, Yeah. and, you know, go do a bunch of paperwork and blah, blah, blah. Um, But, yeah, so uh, this guy, um, you know, the USA Today had uh, some tweet about this is exactly the kind of guy that you want um, carrying a gun or whatever. Uh, but there was, you know, other people there, and we don't know anything about them. And they, so they still create this fright yeah. over people carrying and there's, guns. There's absolutely no reason to believe that they're not every one of them is a legal permit holder. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, and maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But yeah. I mean, I, I would bet that they were. Yeah, and they're all in church together with this guy who's a firearms instructor. So who's to say he didn't train them all? Well, too? yeah, and I think there's a high chance of that. Yeah. So. Um, but the the. I, I think the point is clear. Like, you had a bunch of people that were cowering behind their pews like they should have been yeah. um, if you weren't prepared to deal with this. And you had about a half dozen people that drew their weapons and, uh, and moved towards the guy, yeah. towards the uh, the attacker. Right and he that. was able to kill two people, but that's yeah. it. Yeah. And that wouldn't have been it if there hadn't been other people in there say, with guns. I was going to say, imagine if they had had that magic sign on the door that said, no guns allowed, like you see in banks and places like that. Yeah. I mean, well, obviously, he would have done what I do, which is to go put the bu- gun back in the car and get the crowbar out. <laughs> yeah, you think so? Yeah, that'd be real. That'd be a lot more fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> crowbar a bunch of people. Yeah. No. Every time I go into a bank, I cringe. And you, I don't always take my gun into the bank, but it says it's explicitly not to take my gun in there. Like, And there's even like a state law. It's like provision XXX of the state of Alabama says mm-hmm. you cannot carry a firearm in this facility. Yeah. Well, and I, I understand that too, and um, I, you know, I have my carry permit, and I, I carry do. my gun into those places that say "Don't carry I your do. gun in here." And I respect private property too, but here's what it comes down to in the end: I'd rather have the gun and not need it than need it and not have it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And of all places, a bank. Yeah. Like that's well, what they're always... pretty secure, actually. So. Dude, have you seen no, the banks I go to? I, mean, I don't know. Maybe you go to different banks than I do. You say pretty secure. Somebody walk in there with a gun anytime they want to. They ain't got well, any metal no, detectors that, in there. Yeah, no, you're right about that. I mean, they just can't really get very much. Oh, yeah. Well, they may not. <laughs> yeah, no, you're probably right about that. The banks I go to ain't got a lot of money in them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the uh, cash access is slim. Yeah. And there's long jail times for that stuff. You're oh. much better knocking over like a... Um, uh, like a package store or something. But uh, okay, so I deal with a bank that that is not a very good bank. Not personally, I deal. Not with that my, I'm giving advice on who yeah. to steal from. <laughs> but here's my worry dealing with. So the bank that my company banks with is a horrible bank. And honest to goodness, I worry every time I go in there that somebody that's mad at the bank is going to come in and shoot up the bank just because they're like. These guys took so much of my money. I'm tired of I'm tired of this, and just go shoot them up. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, and maybe that's an irrational fear. Well, I mean, but, if they stopped and thought about it, they would realize that the government takes way more of their money than the bank does. <laughs> maybe so, but these people in line get mad. I saw one today. Mm-hmm. This guy was red in the face, yelling at this dude. Yeah, and so he eventually left. And the whole time the the tellers taking care of me, I'm like, God, I hope that guy don't come back in here. Yeah, because I mean, people just get so angry about stuff. And you I don't left know. your gun in your car today. 
I did. Oh. Yeah, no, seriously. That's the reason I was like, man, I got to get out of this bank. Yeah. <laughs> I don't always leave in the car, but I did today. Yeah. So I won't tomorrow. <laughs> and you left your crowbar too, huh? Yeah, no crowbar. Either. Hey, wonder yeah. how they feel about that. Uh, maybe that's what I should start doing. <laughs> Everywhere that has one of those signs that's no gun, <laughs> just open carry my crowbar in yeah. there. <laughs> a big baton or something. <laughs> right. Oh, I got a nice crowbar at the house. Yeah. I'd love to carry it around. <laughs> you think anybody will say anything about that? I don't know. <laughs> Only one way to find out. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you're not breaking any laws. Uh, I, I know exactly. That. <laughs> I bet they'll find something. Yeah, I imagine they would assume that you were there to steal then. And <laughs> yeah, like you right. came in with a crowbar. <laughs> oh. Um, well, so I, I want to go ahead and wrap it up, especially because this is our first time with this new setup, and I want to make sure that everything came out all right, and I'm going to need a little bit more time to make sure that everything came out all right. Um, also, uh, you know, I, I, I'm kind of ready to move around a little bit more. <laughs> this is an uncomfortable. We got to get the, a more comfortable. Well, stuff. I, I pulled we'll a figure, muscle we'll, over the weekend too. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah. my shoulder is really tightening up. We'll figure this setup out. It'll yeah. take a, it may take a cast or two, but we'll get there. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And there are some things that we haven't talked about that I really think are important. We haven't talked about Brexit at all. No. Um, we haven't talked about the OPCW scandal. Um, okay. I mean, and that's a really good follow up for us because we spent a lot of time talking about the Syria gas attacks, oh, yeah. um, and how they were bunk. And now there's information coming out of the OPCW that they knew that they were bunk and they still put out these reports and they like cleverly censored the reports to make it not obvious that, well, that none and of that's not getting any, any news at all. No, no, at least not, not that I've heard. Um, and then, uh, you know, I put a whole bunch together about, um, uh, Syria, Palestine and the BDS movement, um, before Christmas even. And, uh, we hadn't gotten a chance to talk about that too, cause we spent too much time talking about something else <laughs> on that podcast. Oh, we did. I don't even remember what it was now, but I do remember, no, I remember no. us doing that. <laughs> There's a record of it, luckily. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, all, all this and more whenever we're not starting World War Three. Yeah. Don't worry, we're not starting World War III. <laughs> not yet. I don't know, man. Every day's a new day. No, um, we might be starting o Iraq War Four. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see where this goes. Um, I, I wouldn't. The the sky's not falling yet, though. No. And uh, well, that's a good note to end it on. The sky's not falling yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice and positive. We we like to. <laughs> pump our people up at the end that's right um so uh we're gonna be back in a week absolutely yeah all right well join us again in a week when we finally get this right um in the meantime uh follow us on facebook and uh subscribe on itunes or podbean uh, like and share um give us feedback tell us if the sound quality is better i hope it is yeah um, i'm looking forward to kind of digging in that's what i'm gonna do the next couple of d uh, next day is listen to this one and then listen to the other ones and see what I think. Oh uh, yeah. And our, uh, John who provided the intro outro music. I like it. I'd like to record it with the good mics. Uh, mornings are rough for me, <laughs> but we'll, we'll figure <laughs> something out. Yeah. We are getting it done. Um, and, uh, until next time, uh, try and stay free. Train how you fight. Ciao. Later. <laughs>